When I entered the Army 62 years ago, uh, it was still a segregated country, although the Army had been integrated. And we have come a long way that allowed me to rise to the top of my profession, but it isn't over yet. Racism still exists. We still have people who want to take it out on people who are people of color. And we have to make especially the President of the United States, has to be an example to the rest of the country that we are one nation, one people, and make sure that we can make these systems go away, these systems of racism and the kind of intolerance that still exists in our country. Well, this week, the United States mourned the loss of Colin Powell. And while he leaves behind a complicated foreign policy legacy, his reign as a barrier breaker cannot be denied. He was a retired four-star general, the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the first black secretary of state. But decades after these historic firsts, the military remains a challenging place for many people of color, rife with deep-seated racism and discrimination. Joining me now is Army combat veteran and New York congressional candidate, Brittany ramos Debarros, and Malcolm Nance, MSNBC contributor and author of The Plot to Betray America. Uh, Brittany, I want to start with you because black women joined the military uh, at higher rates than men uh, and all other racial ethnic groups. Um, you uh, and, and we should say that it's not just black people who are discriminated against. The Latino population is also uh, discriminated against. You represent both communities as an Afro-Latina. I'm curious, what was your experience like in the military? And did you have any encounters uh, that were, you know, overtly uh, sexist and or racist? Yes, thank you so much, Tiffany. It's an honor to be here. And this is an important question and a conversation about ultimately about representation and leadership, right? And this is a conversation that we have at a level that is too shallow, I think. Of course, representation matters. And of course, I had those kinds of racist and, and sexist experiences, both for myself and I witnessed my troops. Uh, and I also witnessed a system that refused to address those issues consistently and systematically. Um, and, you know, when we when we talk about representation, of course it matters. It's one of the reasons I'm running for Congress. And I remember what it felt like to be a young Afro-Latina officer with a platoon that was almost entirely black and Latinx. And importantly, looking around and realizing that almost all of the officers were still white men who couldn't understand the cultural context or lived experiences of their own troops. But we also have to stop talking about this issue as if it's one that can be addressed through personal or individual achievement and behavioral co corrections. To talk about this disparity, to really understand it, we have to talk about economics. We have to talk about the poverty draft, and we have to talk about how many of our top brass and elected officials are in bed with corporate war profiteers and the way that that shapes the leadership priority. In my own district, we have two military bases and not a single public hospital. We have huh. crumbling bridges and infrastructure, but our only robust federal jobs and scholarship programs requires you to carry a gun for the government. And our incumbent is a woman who sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee but has never had a real job outside of politics in her life, has already taken almost half a million from corporate lobbyists and, and, so, and, and PACs. And, yeah. and when you add to that her complicity in the white nationalist attack on our nation's capital, of course someone like her on that committee is not going to meaningfully address the reality that one in five of those insurrectionists was active military or a veteran. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. I want to make that point with you, Malcolm. Uh, we talked about this before. Like she said, one in five people who uh, participated in trying to overthrow the will of the people served in the military. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, rank and file. I mean, the, the, the racism and disparities exist when it comes to decision makers. Uh, people of color are not in, in ranks where they make crucial decisions, like how to respond to the coronavirus crisis, how many troops are sent to Afghanistan or Syria. All of these folks are overwhelmingly white men. You have done a great service in this country and serve uh, in the military. What was your experience like and why is this? Why is this that white men still dominate the military when people of color disproportionately serve? Well, it's very interesting because Ms. Ramos is absolutely right about how there appears to be this hierarchy that once you get to a certain level, um, they filter out people of color and they certainly filter out women and gays. Uh, in my experience, which came inside the U.S. military intelligence community, I was, uh, in my time, over 20 years, only one of four, maybe five African Americans working in this extremely secretive world of, of linguistics and code breaking, and they worked very hard. 
uh, the people who were within that community to suss us out. Uh, one of one of the best that ever existed did get out, uh, you know, due to a lot of pressure, and that was uh, the t future talk show host Montel Williams, former code breaker, Russian linguist, working yeah. at the National Security Agency. You wouldn't know that, but right. the, the point is this. There is a system that has been put in place. My family has served nonstop in the armed forces since 1864. We know that there are disparities. We know that there is racism. We know that the that a very large proportion of the service members, the enlisted service members, are going to be people who are uh, Latin American, uh, um, African American, um, and women. Yeah, These are yeah. the, the the materials that you have to work with. The military's own structure of laws, rules, and regulations assist you in working with that. But there is a hard core of prejudice in there. And I, I think the word prejudice is, is a little wrong. I think the word is entitlement. Many people who come in as officers feel that they are entitled to, uh -huh. uh, you know, to board over these particular types of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And what they yeah. don't see is that they make their own forces far more ineffective in doing right. that. Yeah, and look, you know very well. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, this is very prevalent, has been throughout history. You think about how black soldiers were treated after World War One, fighting for their country to come back and be treated like second-class citizens. There were white people who wouldn't salute these black men who fought and bled and died uh, for their country. So it's, it's uh, kind of crazy. Listen, Malcolm, we're out of time, but I got to ask you while I have you here, this kidnapping mm -hmm. in Haiti with these 17 uh, missionaries, you know, I'm a layperson, so forgive my ignorance here, but I look at something like this and wonder, why doesn't the military just... Uh, uh, go in and get those people out. What's the danger of negotiating uh, with these people demanding ransom? You know, what, what do you think? If you were in charge, what would you do in this situation? Well, you asked the right guy. I ran, actually, the Armed Forces Hostage Survival School. Um, it's very difficult because this is where you get into the, the, the crux of uh, diplomatic and military activities. The government of Haiti would have to invite us to come in and carry out an activity surveillance. The FBI has purview on that in this particular circumstance. We have enough capacity with the FBI hostage rescue team or U.S. intelligence assets, but really the government of Haiti would have to uh, surrender all of their authority to us. And then we would have to make the decision in accordance with the families. And we're probably yeah. not going to do that unless people start getting killed. And I, I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon. Wow. Well, we'll have to have you back when we talk more about that. So uh, thank you so much, Brittany ramos DeBarles. Good luck in your campaign. And thank you, uh, Malcolm Nance, for always uh, delivering great information when you're on TV. So thanks for being here.